Hello, this is Simon Brew. I'm the editor of Film Stories magazine and a very warm welcome to the Film Stories podcast. Particular thanks too for the people who've lent me DVDs to help me put this podcast together. Here's one of those kind folks now. I want them back! They're my property! Come with me. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In movies. Movies that had stories. That the story just sucks them in. This is just the beginning. Stories. We would be honoured if you would join us. Hello and a very warm welcome to Film Stories with Simon Brew. I am Simon Brew. That's always that's everything you need to know about me. The aim of the podcast, though, well, as the title suggests, I'm here to talk of the stories of films. And I tend to talk about development stories, production stories, release stories, marketing stories, all the ingredients, really, that go towards making the films that we know and sometimes love. Just that, the films that we know and sometimes love. The films I tend to cover on this podcast lean more towards the mainstream than anything else. They're films I'm interested in or invested in to some degree. I try not to do snark. I try not to punch down. This podcast is a celebration of the movies and a real appreciation that somehow, through some miracle, through all the difficulties, films manage to get made. Without further ado, as always, I'm going to set it up with a clip from the trailer. I will come to the story, the other side of this. As the world fell, each of us in our own way was broken. It was hard to know who was more crazy. Me, or everyone else. And that was part of the trailer for 2015's Mad Max Fury Road, directed by George Miller, script by George Miller, Brendan McCarthy and Nico Lathorius, and starring Tom Hardy, Charlize Theron, Nicholas Holt, uh, Rosie Huntington-Whiteley, Riley Keogh, Zoe Kravitz and Abby Lee. So let's take this story 30 years before the release of the movie we're talking about, 1985's third Mad Max movie, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Now, this this was after the sensational opening pair of Mad Max features from director George Miller. This was a slightly tamer affair, in fact, predating what would happen throughout much of the 2000s. This was one that was brought in at a PG-13 rating in the US, a slightly broader seeking film, if you like, trying to get a more family audience into a Mad Max picture. Tina Turner co-starred with Mel Gibson in the film, but I, I, I mean, it was a it was a tamer affair in more than one sense. And the legendary Barry Norman here in the UK described it as not so much Mad Max as slightly cheesed off Max, which isn't a million miles far off the mark. The film itself didn't really measure up to the first two. It's earned a bit more respect since, and there's a title song to it which continues to resonate. But that looked like it was going to be it as far as George Miller was concerned and the Mad Max saga. He did move on to other projects. He didn't have the best of times on his next film, The Witches of Eastwick. He would move on to the Oscar nominated Lorenzo's Oil. That was up for Best Picture in the early 90s. And then he would go on to The Babe and the Happy Feet films. I'm going to talk about a Babe film in the second half of this podcast. There was still a discussion in the 1990s about reviving Mad Max though. And in 1995 there was talk of a television version of the 
the character and George Miller was going to be involved. In fact, it got as far as Warner Brothers announcing it in November of 1995 that Miller was going to direct some of the episodes. But it's one of those projects that just quietly faded away. Yet if we move to the early 2000s, that's when there was more open talk about a, a full on fourth Mad Max movie. And now George Miller was interested. He'd admitted before that he was reluctant to return to the series. But from about 1997, it had been a bit more in his head that Miller had uh, had a moment that led to the film. And he talked about this in a discussion with the playlist where he said, I remembered the moment when I was walking across a street, a crossing. And he said, while I was in the middle of this uh, of the road, I got this sudden flash of a story. By the time I got across the street, I realised, oh, my God, that's a Mad Max movie. It was the core idea. Now, that didn't mean he was instantly looking to make it. He was involved in the second Babe film at this point. But it was it was one of those things that just stuck in his head. He'd been reluctant to go back. And he did say at the time, the last thing I ever wanted to do was a Mad Max movie. So I pushed it away. But then we move forward to 2001 and a long flight that Miller was taking from Hollywood back to Sydney and he found himself running through a version of what a new Mad Max film could be and what he began to appreciate was at some point there is going to be another Mad Max film and it's one of those moments where it's just like well if I don't do it someone else might do it instead and on that flight a nice long haul flight he worked out what this film was going to be and and so it got to a point where he was talking to studios and, yeah, this was going to happen. In fact, come 2003, it looked like things were really moving forward. 20th Century Fox was the studio that was going to back a new Mad Max movie. Warner Brothers had backed the first three. And Heath Ledger was going to start opposite Mel Gibson. There had been early talk at that stage of casting Charlize Theron in a role, but at this point, her agent wasn't interested. She would, Theron would mention during the press tour for Fury Road, telling the New York Times, no one ever told me about it. But events outside of the world of Mad Max stalled the movie because vehicles were already being built from the early 2000s for Mad Max 4 and the production was pushing for a March 2003 start but a couple of major world events one was the tragedy of an atrocities of 9-11 and the other was also the huge loss of life in the Iraq war and these were all things that were concentrated in the early 2000s and basically the political landscape felt wrong for a, a Mad Max film. But also there were practical knock-ons as well because with the Iraq conflict underway, well, the shoot had been planned for the Namib Namibian desert. And the cost of insurance just off the back of the aftermath of 9-11 had rocketed. And also the, the, the sensitivities just felt a little bit wrong. They did get quite a way down the road. Colin Gibson, the production designer on the film, was in the Namibian desert when he got a phone call saying, do not spend any more money. The plug has been pulled. This is not going to happen now, in spite of the fact that quite a lot of resource had already been committed towards the project. And so Miller just... I mean, he saw how it was panning out, dusted himself down and headed off towards the first of the Happy Feet films as it looked as though Mad Max 4 was pretty much dead in the water. Yet Happy Feet would prove to be an inspired choice for George Miller. The 2006 animated film was sold brilliantly off the back of Tap Dancing Penguins and less off, let's just say, the darker elements of that story. It was a huge box office success for Warner Brothers. It attracted Oscar attention as well. And now Miller had currency again that he could go to the offices of Warner Brothers who were very keen for a Happy Feet too. And it's like, well, if you want Happy Feet too, how about we do this as well? And by the end of 2000, 2006, Warner Brothers was interested in a Mad Max 4 and Miller was once again back in the Mad Max business and could start rebuilding his film. Now it was going to be slightly different that there was a, a change of cast for a start that Mel Gibson's star let's just say had fallen and was falling but also the passage of time meant that the central character of Max well, still needed to be younger than Gibson really and so the version of Mad Max 4 that was officially announced in 2009 was quite a retooled version of what we were going to get originally in 2003. 
because I mean B Gibson had burnt his bridges there's no way around that you can look that up everywhere on the internet that's and I, I, I won't go into it here but I do want to acknowledge he had burnt his bridges he was not going to return but who would well one person who was involved in reading certainly reading with some of the actors who were cast in the film was Jeremy Renner he was one of the leading candidates to take on the role of Max the rebooted Max if you like and also Eminem was said to have been considered but he was reluctant to leave the country to shoot the film and so it was Tom Hardy who ultimately bobbled to the top of George Miller's list and he was confirmed as on board in June 2010. Hardy was going to be the new Max, the film wouldn't make anything of it, would just carry on with the character there and that seemed to be pretty much that. And what that also meant was that auditions were getting underway in Australia to cast the other supporting roles in the film. Meanwhile, while that was going on, it is worth noting that George Miller for a while was toying with the idea of, well, if we've got all of these, all of this construction going on, all of these vehicles, let's make two films at the same time. Let's do two back to back that he was looking. He'd worked out a story for a Furiosa film that would have served as a prequel to Mad Max Fury Road and so for a while that was looking like it, it had some degree of legs the idea was eventually parked Charlie's Tehran would come on in the role of Furiosa her agent would pass the details on this time and then the auditions go down underway in Australia were casting the key supporting roles and Zoe Kravitz told Carl Buchanan in his excellent oral history book of when they cast her she said I was brought to a room that I wasn't allowed to leave and I sat there and read the script and she said it was one of the strangest script I'd ever seen because it was like a really long comic book. And she wasn't the only one who was struggling with it. That director of photography, John Seal, had come out of retirement to make the film. And anyone who was looking for a traditional script that Miller and his team had put together just simply wasn't going to get it. This was not a film bursting with dialogue anyway. But what Miller had plotted out was a whole bunch of storybook sequences that, if you're approaching a film in a traditional sense, might have been quite difficult to wrap your head around. John Seal was one of the many who just kind of figured, well, I don't quite get this. But, I mean, we're in 2002 ten at this point there's been a decade of pre-production work already and he trusted the fact that George Miller knew the film at heart that he wanted to make so it got to a point where filming was two weeks away from starting in 2010 this time it wasn't going to Namibia for the shoot it was going to the Australian desert much close to home for George Miller and an area where the lack of rain had been a real boon it had dried the ground out a beautiful desert environment that had been scouted all the vehicles were built dozens and dozens of vehicles done practically for the film uh, the stunt co the, the stunt team had been training intensely for some time the actors had been been put through their paces the pre-production was really underway to a very very advanced point and then out of nowhere came what was described as a once in a century level of rainfall just out of the sky water and no shortage of it on an area of land where they just hadn't seen it to anywhere that de anywhere like that degree for generations and this was two weeks before filming was due to start on Mad Max Fury Road but that was just the start of the problem because if it had just been the rain, well, they could wait for the rain to dry out and that would be fine. Then they could carry on. But what the rain meant was really basically enrich the land. And so the desert landscape was now transformed into into a vista of greenery. And so now you've got all these vehicles designed to drive across this desert that was at the heart of what was needed for the film. But. It's like driving through a very, very pleasant set of gardens. I mean, it was just green as far as the eye could see. And the, the production just had to be mothballed. This was an absolutely critical point for the fourth Mad Max film. They had a, a really kind of binary choice here. Do you wait it out? And, and just hope that it clears up and then go for it? Or do you just abandon the whole thing? And they did decide to mothball that they decided, well, let, let's pack everything up and wait a year and see if the landscape comes back to normal. And in the end, it just wasn't happening. And so Miller then took a further drastic option that even though everything was already in Australia and ready to shoot, they were going back to the Namibia option. They were going to cut everything 
everything over to the desert uh, in Namibia. Huge trucks, huge trucks, huge vehicles. All the cr cast and crew had to go over. The stunt performers had to go over, and the whole thing had to be set up again on a completely different continent. And as Miller told Collider at the time, he just said we were all geared up for Fury Road to shoot in the Australian desert. Then those unprecedented rains came, and what what was the wasteland? Completely flat red earth is now a flower garden and the big massive salt flats where they do world record speed trials is full of pelicans and fish where the fish came from i had no idea and so he was saying at the time theoretically next week we we have a hundred the shoot is next year we have 150 big vehicles built but to be perfectly honest he said i just finished on happy feet i'm not even there in my head right now because he had been working on the second happy feet movie so it's not like he wasn't busy but still, when a film disappears, I mean, I covered Greatest Days on this podcast a couple of weeks ago. And at the point where that had to shut down and then remount a year or so down the line, uh, members of the cast had other commitments that they had to fulfil. And so they had to drop out of the film. Remarkably, in the case of Mad Max Fury Road, the casting held. You still got Charlize Theron. You still got Nicholas Holt. You still got Tom Hardy. You still got the ensemble cast. That was around, uh, including people like Rosie Huntington Whiteley and Zoe Kravitz. And uh, uh, in other films, some of those roles may have been recast, but there was something really just gluing everything together here. Now, Miller had been working on the script with a, 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 a number of collaborators, but he was also very aware that he was asking some of the performers to take on roles. Uh, their characters were sex slaves that the character of Furiosa was trying to save. And he wanted these characters to be properly fleshed out. He wanted them to, to not be ciphers. He wanted them to have presence in the film and agency in the film. And so he brought in some help. He brought in a playwright by the name of Eve Ensler. And and Eve Ensler had penned the vagina monologues and she worked not just to help with the script, but also with the actors who were taking on those roles just to make sure that, that there was there was real depth to what was being put on screen, that this wasn't just some lazy writing. There was something of real substance there. Tehran, meanwhile, she was continuing to explore the character of Furiosa. And Furiosa was originally going to be long haired. And th the practicalities of that niggled with Tehran. It's just like, if you're working with all this machinery, would you have that? And so she asked for her character to be a little more androgynous, for her head to be shaved. And when that look was revealed on the set of the film, I mean, it made headlines around the world. I mean, that that's where really the attention of Mad Max was at that point. But in July 2012, in Namibia, filming finally got underway and to say it would not be an easy shoot is no understatement whatsoever as colin gibson told the new york times all the action had to be real the hair can't stand up on the back of your neck not for me anyway watching vin diesel drag a three-ton safe down through perfect right angle turns on the street that is colin gibson throwing shade at fast five chums the whole rationale he said was to make it as real as possible so that as much as possible was at stake it was also being shot pretty much chronologically, which would provide just a little bit of help when it came to the edit. I'm coming to that shortly. But again, going back to Carl Buchanan's book, which started as an article in the New York Times, and then he had so much material, he expanded it out into a full oral history book. It's a tremendous read. He talks of how stunt performers would chat about ordinarily on a blockbuster film. You would be preparing for one major stunt a week, something around that level. And you do all the preparation for it. You would shoot it. If needs be, you would go back to it. In the case of Mad Max Fury Road, they were having to do one a day. I remember after the film was released, one of the stunt performers just put a video they'd shot on uh, Twitter or whatever it's called now and it just showed that their entire viewpoint was just this massive ball of flame the stunt performers were absolutely in the midst of this and just the post just that one single perspective I found absolutely jaw-dropping there was no green screen here that while there was effects work that was done in post-production what you see action wise in the film is what was shot they wanted what I mean they wanted that level of excitement they wanted it to work but this was also putting an immense strain on the people at the heart of it. It's pretty well known that Tom Hardy was on the prickly side, for instance, on the set of Mad Max Fury Road, and that he and Charlize Theron were not really getting along. 
along that they've got on better since but it was not the most fun shoot and understandable to a degree there were long days when people were just crammed in a vehicle and there wasn't much in the surrounding area where you could go and let your hair down after shooting had completed well Charlize Theron would have struggled to get her hair down at that point obviously few people here were in their comfort zone even people who'd done action films before had seen nothing like what George Miller was trying to do furthermore even though us as viewers see it in a desert that looks absolutely scorching the reality of it was it was freezing cold and some of the filming was being done at night as well so while all the crew could wrap up the cast couldn't and as Zoe Kravitz said it had been nine months and nine months not nine months where you're in a city and you hang out in your trailer it was nine months of the environment you're seeing in the movie with nothing around and she said you really do start to lose your mind a little now, as Hardy would reflect at the press conference of the film, he did say, in hindsight, I was in over my head in many ways. And he talked about the tension between him and Charlize Theron behind the scenes. The pressure on both of us was overwhelming at times, he admitted. And what she needed was a better, perhaps more experienced partner in me. And he said, that's something that can't be faked. I like to think that now that I'm older and uglier, I could rise to that occasion. And come the release of the film, Hardy would indeed apologise for how things had gone. I mean, it was said too that he was incredibly tough on George Miller uh, during the shoot. But then also, this was the kind of film where, because there wasn't a script, because there was not an obvious roadmap that people could could kind of lock into, no one quite fully got the film that George Miller was trying to make. No one could really see it in the way that Miller could, which put overwhelming amounts of pressure on Miller himself. And also, I mean, shooting in Namibia, whilst on the one hand meant it were, the film was far away from the reaches of Hollywood studios, that didn't mean that Miller wasn't having to deal with pressure from Warner Brothers because Warner Brothers was worried. The film was pushing its budget and was pushing its schedule as well. And it got to the point where this very complex practical movie was running five days over schedule. Warner Brothers was investing nine figures in the movie. And so the then head of Warner Brothers, Jeff Robinob, flew to the set in October 2012 to try and keep it on schedule. As, as was described, the president, as Jack Seal said it this way, the president of Warner Brothers flew to Namibia and had a gold-plated fit that again it was hard to get a tangible fix on what this was from the point of view of the president of Warner Brothers it was running late it wasn't hitting schedule and he was insistent this had to wrap up this had to be done filming by the end of the year now there was a problem with that because the schedule was such they hadn't shot the start and the end which I'll come to shortly but Warner Brothers sent an experienced producer Denise Denovi to the set to keep an eye on the film she wouldn't take credit in the picture in the end but also there there wasn't an awful lot she could actually influence. It had been planned to wrap up in November 2012. It wasn't really looking like it could. And when Mad Max Fury Road did finish shooting in Namibia in December 2012, the start and the end of the movie hadn't been filmed. But Warner Brothers denied the request to spend a few more weeks just getting those elements on film. What this meant was Miller went into the editing room knowing that he didn't have a start and an end to the picture this was going to be a problem he'd got to the end of a very very taxing physical shoot having basically had seven shades kicked out of him having lost weight and then having to wrestle something together without bluntly all the tools required to do so it was Margaret Sixall, Miller's editor and also his wife, who had the job of fashioning the footage into something that worked. She'd never done an action film of this ilk before. This was all new to her too. And the first thing she had to do was just watch the stuff. Um, as, as she revealed to Far Out magazine, this was not an easy film to cut. She said that the overall orchestration was more challenging than anyone seen. Some of it looks deceptively simple, but the variables were enormous. Every sequence had a huge number of hours put into it and every scene had to earn its place. No fat, no repetition. She was working 10 hours a day, six days a week, and it took 6,000 hours to edit the film. But perhaps that's not a surprise because it 
took three months just to watch the footage, depending which source you believe. I'll go with the Sydney Morning, Morning Herald. There were 480 hours of material. And I, I do this comparison quite a lot. If you go to the James Bond film that came out around the same time, Spectre. In the case of Spectre, they had three months to edit that film from the point that production finished, that the last shot was called three months later, the film was in cinemas. Margaret Sixall had three months just to watch what had been shot, never mind edit it, never mind knock it into any kind of shape, just to physically watch the material took as long as it took to edit, to, to complete the post-production at least, on Spectre. The extensive, uh, the extensive edit also required around a thousand visual effect shots to be worked in as well. And in the background, there was studio politics playing out as well, because one of the reasons that Jeff Robinov had been so tough on the film was he was fighting to save his job as the president of Warner Brothers movie side. And in the midst of it all, he lost his job and in came his successor, a man called Kevin Sujara. And he was more sympathetic for the film because... I, a new head of the studio comes in and thus takes a look at what's in the locker, what's on the slab. And so he took a look at how Mad Max Fury Road was shaping up and he realised then that if they were going to go for this, they had to properly back it. They had to put the release back. They had to uh, go for the reshoots. The film needed a start and an end. Otherwise, it's just an illogical waste of money. The logistics of reshoots were incredible because once again, those hundred, all those vehicles had to had to be back in Namibia. They had to be back in the desert. The actors had to be back there as well. The stunt performers, some of them on poles, remember, they had to be back there as well. And it wasn't until the end of 2013 that they managed to re reassemble everyone and everything. And Warner Brothers authorised one month of extra shooting to get the top and the tail of the picture in place. Again, Against this, the studio, whilst it was sympathetic on the one hand, it wanted a really lean running time on the other. I mean, the first two Mad Max films in particular are incredibly lean if you consider their running times. Warner Brothers was looking for a PG-13 rated movie that would run comfortably under two hours. And well, it wasn't really getting it because Margaret Sixall would reflect that she didn't feel that Warner Brothers fully believed in it, but decided, well, I'm going to work through it anyway, because I believe in it. I see what we're trying to do. And, and she's just going to carry on, basically, until someone tells her to stop. And so she delivered in the end, on behalf of George Miller, two different cuts of the film. One was the contractually mandated PG-13 version of Mad Max Fury Road. The other was an R-rated cut. And Warner Brothers to its credit, agreed to test screen both of them. I should note that in the midst of all this, Junkie XL was contributing one of the very best action movie scores of the 2010s. But of the, of the two different cuts of the film that were tested, to the delight really of George Miller and his team, it was the R-rated movie that was coming out the best. That was the one that was, was really scoring the highest. This was a cut that ran to two hours pretty much on the dot. But Warner Brothers had invested, uh, what, 150 million, possibly a bit more to get to that point. It had got co production partners with the likes of Village Roadshow Pictures and Rat Pack Dune Entertainment as well. So it hadn't put every bit of the funding in itself but it put a sizable amount in and it had a lot a lot at stake here and so it was it decided right we're gonna do the gamble and the final cut of the film once those involved saw it it was a jaw-dropping moment for many of them because when they were in the midst of it they had no idea this is how it was going to come out i will put my cards on the table here i think mad max fury road is an absolute masterpiece and the best action film to come out of a hollywood studio in a very 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 long time extraordinary levels of action that it's quite telling that even the actors in the midst of it all didn't quite couldn't quite wrap their head around it such was the intensity of it all on the 7th of May 2015, the film premiered and then it quickly went to the Cannes Film Festival straight afterwards as well. I had a friend who was working on the promotion of Mad Max Fury Road at the time and they told me, uh, just ahead really, this is incredible. And they're not someone who was particularly known for Hyperbole, but there was talk really ahead of the film's release that, the, the, from the people who'd seen it, that this was something incredibly special and it doesn't happen that often. I think it happened with Top Gun Maverick 
as well uh, in recent times. But this was a blockbuster that was really quite different. The reviews for it were absolutely ecstatic absolutely ecstatic and reflective really of what the actors had found that they'd not seen anything quite like this certainly even if you'd watched the previous Mad Max films and I'm a huge fan of two of them the the scale of what was being put on screen was an enormous step up and the fact that it hung together and worked and had layers to it as well just felt like an achievement and a half in the midst of a Hollywood blockbuster environment in 2015 remember where it's franchises it's superheroes that's the kind of stuff that was selling and here was an r-rated action movie a, a follow-up to a film that it, the last one had come out what 30 years before and here we were here we were with something really quite special now what that didn't necessarily mean was it would transfer to box office but in this case the film whilst it didn't go absolutely catastrophically nuts it certainly performed very 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 strongly it's opening weekend in the u.s may the 15th to the 17th it opened in second place 45.4 million dollars opening weekend held off the top spot by pitch perfect 2 which came in at just shy of 70 million dollars also in the top 10 at this point avengers age of ultron this is the kind of thing it was up against the comedy hot pursuit hadn't really done a lot for warner brothers that was in fourth fast and furious 7 paul blart mall cop 2 odd they never made a third one of those isn't it ex machina to its credit was hanging in the top 10 as well but the thing with mad max fury road was it held a good chunk of its audience the following week pitch perfect 2 lost 55 percent of its audience mad max fury road lost 45 percent and the word of mouth was building now it dropped to third place because tomorrowland came out with a 33 million opening the poltergeist reboot remake whatever it was had 22 million and was sat in four so there was a lot of competition competition coming but Mad Max would hang around the chart even as films like San Andreas and Spy and Insidious 3 came along and it would bubble in the top five for a good month really it would hang around the top 10 even longer than that and by the end of the summer in the US it had made 153 million which for an R-rated action movie felt I mean this was pre-Deadpool really as well so R-rated films still rated as a massive gamble and here was one that delivered also the word of mouth had spread overseas so outside of the US another 225 million in the bank worldwide gross for Mad Max Fury Road 379 million and ordinarily in the land of Mad Max that would be that there would be a conversation about a follow-up which there was uh, but that that's it however at the Academy Awards the following year Mad Max Fury Road picked up Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Cinematography, Best Visual Effects and also one on top of that for its editing, production design, costume, makeup and hairstyle, sound mixing and sound editing. It won six Oscars and remarkably the fourth film in a franchise was nominated for Best Picture and deservedly so. It was coming top of many critics uh, top 10 lists of the year. It's appeared in Best Films of the Decade decades list as well and Miller is now back in that world because if you go back to earlier in the story when we we're talking about there are two films in that there is the Furiosa film too in fact there was one called it was going to be called Mad Max the Wasteland for a little while but it's the Furiosa prequel that in the end was has moved forward it was held up by a lawsuit a couple of years after the release of Mad Max Fury Road over bonuses that were said to be owed but at the point of this being recorded, well, Furiosa and Mad Max Saga is in post-production. Uh, the many hours of footage are being edited and it is scheduled for release in June of 2023. Miller has just made one film in the intervening period. He has put all of his energies back into the world of Mad Max. And if it's anything like Fury Road, then every other film in 2024 has a hell of a job on their hands. If you want to financially support what we're doing, then if you head to patreon.com slash Simon Brew and put some money in the pot there, you get the podcast early, you get it ad free, you find out the gossip of what we're up to behind the scenes as well. Thank you to everyone who supports the podcast that way. It's been invaluable in, let's just say, a very, very taxing year. There's also a crowdfunder running at Just Giving for Film Junior magazine, which I'm doing quite quietly. But if anyone would like to help, just really help this print magazine that I'm 
and make for young film fans to try and inspire the next generation. If you search for film stories at Just Giving, you'll find the details of that there. Costing you absolutely nothing is if you can subscribe to this podcast if you like it. That really helps with algorithms and things like that and is much appreciated. And ideally as well, if you can leave a hugely positive review, algorithms seem to like that. More people seem to discover us and I can't tell you how grateful I am to the many people who have done that for me. I, I thank you, thank you, thank you so much. If I've not bored you completely, you can find more from me on Twitter at Simon Brew, Twitter X, whatever it is. I'm on Blue Sky too at that uh, at exactly the same username. Uh, Film Stories is on X Twitter thingy at Film Stories. We're on Facebook.com/slash Film Stories Online, YouTube.com/slash Film Stories. We try and put audio versions of the podcast on the YouTube channel as well uh, for those who want them there. Our shop is store.filmstories.co.uk. Lots of magazines and our Blu-rays of No Way Out and Bull Durham are available there and if you go to filmstories.co.uk that's updated every weekday with movie news reviews features we've got games on there we've got tv stuff on there we've been seeing a real boost in traffic we try and make a non-clickbaity film film news website basically uh, which is a lot harder to do than you'd think because well lots of reasons we're over five years into this project now bizarrely and uh, somehow we're still going and that means i better go off and watch some more films because I'm going to be back soon with another episode of Film Stories. Uh, Until then, you all take care. You all look after yourselves. The most important thing is you're all safe and well. I hope you continue to be so. Take care and I'll be back soon with some more Film Stories. Bye-bye.